Thank you. Um, I'm here to give you a brief, a really brief overview of the research that we're doing with the Agricultural Research Service across the United States. And so I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you over the next 15 minutes. And so if you know anything about biochar, you know that when you create biochar, there's a number of factors that influence that, that final outcome. And one could argue that there are three main factors that influence the outcome of that final product, and those are feedstock choice, paralysis temperature, and paralysis type. And when we look at feedstock choice, you've already heard some feedstocks this, or this afternoon, but we have a, a huge range of feedstocks that we can draw from, from some of these agricultural grasses to hardwoods and softwoods to, to manures. And depending on what you choose as your feedstock input, you're going to end up with a product that's completely different from one another. You can also look at paralysis temperature, and we can pyrolyze materials less than 300 C, you know, torrified product, or we can go as, you know, well over 800 degrees C. And depending on how you pyrolyze or the temperature that you pyrolyze, you end up with a different product. And last but certainly not least in this list are the um, types of paralysis. And I would say that by far in the literature, the literature is dominated by either a fast or slow paralysis, although there are other paralysis types. And depending on the type that you use, again, you end up with a different product. And so the concept with the ARS is to take all these and put them together to create a biochar for beneficial use. And so what we can do is we can make some generalizations on, say, paralysis temperature. And these are, these are, these are generalizations based on the literature. So if we increase paralysis temperature, we tend to see things like a decrease in biochar yield, but we also see increases in total elemental content in general terms, et cetera. We can also make some generalizations about paralysis type. And if we compare fast versus slow paralysis, one could highly argue that slow paralysis favors a lot of the constituents in, in the final product that you would, as a researcher or a land applicator, would want or desire. For example, available nutrient content is greater under, say, slow paralysis versus fast paralysis. And so the concept that we're dealing with within the Agriculture Research Service is to take all the specifics behind these generalizations and put them together. And so what we want to do is we want to put these, these together to not only sequester carbon in the soil, but to improve or remediate degraded soils across the U.S. or you know, around the world, for example by improving things like soil moisture, nutrients, sorbing pollutants, as well as altering either positively or negatively mi microbial signaling. And so what I'm going to do with this talk is I'm going to throw a lot of data at you that deals with these four topics. Okay, and let's, uh, let's start with soil moisture. And I'm not going to talk about this in great detail because Jim did a nice job um, in the prior slide set talking about this. But we know that when we add biochar, in almost every instance, you see an increase in soil moisture content. And this is just one example from the work that we did from two western United States soils. And we added 2% of either a low or a high temperature switchgrass biochar. And those are shown in green and red compared to the control. And what we did was we did a, an infiltration study over time. And this is the first infiltration or leaching study out of four. And we saw the same or similar pattern every time in that when you add biochar, you see an increase in soil water content over time. And so what we did with this data is we went to the, the two locations where we obtained these soils, and we, we looked at the evapotranspiration rates at those locations, and we calculated, based on the biochar application rate and the water holding capacity change, the number of days, if you were a, an irrigated farmer, how many days you could go between irrigation events. And based on ET rates, you could extend your time between irrigation events by either half a day up to two and a half days. And, and that could be significant for irrigated agriculture in the western U.S. or in anywhere in the world for that matter. This is another study. This is a study that came out of the Florence, South Carolina ARS location. And they worked on a soil uh, horizon called the E-horizon in this Norfolk soil series. And this E-horizon is basically a hard pan. So when you have irrigated agriculture or rain-fed conditions in this system, water tends to pond on the surface of this horizon within the soil profile. And so the concept was to add biochar to this one particular soil to increase infiltration through that system. And what they did was they added 1% biochar under various or under different biochars blended together or by themselves, um, different ratios, 
And if you notice over here, the mils per minute passing through are much greater for the most part in all instances as compared to the control. And so the concept here is to do something like deep chisel plowing in production agriculture to mix biochar into that E horizon, which is a few feet below the soil surface, and improve water relations in this system. Okay, switching gears a little bit, some of the work that we've done in the ARS has focused on um, soil nutrients like nitrate, nitrogen. In fact, nitrate's probably the largest nutrient, or nitrogen is the largest nutrient that most of us have focused on, but also phosphorus as well as micronutrients. And when we talk about nitrogen, some of the concepts that have been developed have kind of been geared towards entrapment. So you have mass flow of water moving into pores of these biochar particles, and that water carries nitrate, nitrogen that can be entrapped and later utilized by a crop. And that's one concept. There's another concept that was developed from the ARS location in Ames, Iowa that dealt with anion exchange capacity on, on biochars. And so if we char or we pyrolyze materials at greater than about 700 C, we can actually create some base functional groups that make the biochar act like an anion um, uh, capturing material. It's really interesting to note that if you've read the literature, you don't see a whole lot of biochars developed at greater than maybe 500, 550 C, but you can certainly do this. It's, it's rather interesting. And then we've also done some work with micronutrient availability with biochar applications. This is a study that we performed over 12 months with a hardwood biochar applied at either 0, 1, 2, or 10 percent by weight. And we're looking at, on this y-axis, it's essentially available iron. And what we see is as we increase biochar application rate, we see a nice increase in the available iron content. And so some of these biochars may actually help us increase micronutrient availability in systems like this. This is a western U.S. soil. What we see is over time, that's all the different colored bars, we see over time that the micronutrient availability decreases. And this is, this is not uncommon. I mean, we see this when we add fertilizers to systems. They, you have high availability initially, and then you reduce availability because those available nutrients are becoming less available. They're forming mineral, solid mineral precipitates in the soil. And that's just one example. Here's another example. This is manganese from biochar, and we see the exact same response. Okay, the third point that I want to talk about briefly is metal pollutants. And this is a really, really cool story that I stumbled upon when I started working for the ARS, and it deals with copper sulfate hoof baths. So where I live in Idaho, there's 550,000 head of dairy cows within about a 100-mile radius, and some of these dairies use copper sulfate hoof baths to prevent hoof diseases. And when that hoof bath is spent, it gets dumped into a waste lagoon and then it gets used for irrigation purposes. And what we're realizing in South Central Idaho and in other locations is that we're seeing copper toxicity problems in our crops that are being grown here. And so the concept is to stop this from happening by using, among other products, biochar. And this hoof bath, just so you know, if you've never seen these things, they're, they're obviously blue, they contain about 12,000 to 25,000 parts per million copper. All right? It's huge. And so what we did was a, a study, a shaking study over one month, where we added increase in amounts of copper, which you see on the x-axis, to uh, an, a steam-activated pecan shell biochar. It was kind of out there. It had been worked on before by some of my colleagues, and so we took it one step further. Anyway, we added increase in amounts of copper, and then over a month period, or after a month period, we looked at the amount of copper sorbed. The observed values are in those blue dots, and the predicted curve, or exponential rise to maximum, is the black line. And what this tells you, and here's the equation up on the top, it tells you that this one particular biochar can sorb about 42,000 parts per million copper. And so the concept here is this. To use a material like biochar, for example, to capture copper, from this when it's spent, capture it onto biochar, and then recreate copper sulfate from that captured material that we can feed back into the dairy industry. So we close the loop on this system and we don't have problems in our agricultural settings. It's a really fun project to work on. This is another project that we're, we're working on currently. This is, this is a project where we used, in this instance, lodgepole pine. We also used um, tamarisk and switchgrass biochar. This is lodgepole pine, and what you're looking at is increasing amounts of lodgepole pine biochar, 0, 5, 10, and 15 percent by weight. Um, by the way, this lodgepole pine was from pine beetle kill from the western U.S. 
And so what we did was we took this pine, this lodgepole pine biochar, and we added it to four different soils that are um, contaminated with heavy metals from, from Superfund sites in the western U.S. And so those are the different colored bars. And what you're looking at is basically bioavailable cadmium, copper, manganese, and zinc. And you'll note that when you increase biochar application, you see decreases in, in the, all these heavy metals. Okay, so we're decreasing bioavailable heavy metals. And we think it's one related to pH. We have a change in pH, so we're precipitating some of these metals out. But we're not quite sure, and so we're performing some wet chemical extraction procedures to really discern where those metals are ending up in this system and whether or not they will become bioavailable in the future or not. So what we're doing with this data is we're hoping to gear this project up. And this is a mine site in southwestern Oregon. It has a pH of 3. Obviously, nothing's growing on this. And what we're going to do, uh, we're looking for funding, but in the meantime, what we're doing is we're taking some of these soils and we're adding biochar to those soils to see if we can actually do any good. And so what you're seeing here is a, some preliminary response on the, on the right-hand side, going from 0 to 15% biochar growing uh, some kind of ryegrass. Or, I'm sorry, this is fescue, I believe. And so we're hoping to take this to the field next year and actually do some good at a site that's contaminated well, it has a low pH, it's contaminated with heavy metals. One of the other things we do in our lab, or well, across the U.S. in terms of the ARS, is look at changes in, in um, microorganisms or micro, um, microbial community structure, among other things. And so this was a project that we performed something called FAME analysis, it's fatty acid methyl ester analysis, to ID the different types of microorganisms that are present in this case, under biochar application. And we, we had um, increasing biochar application rates, 0, 1, 2, and 10% by weight. This was a 12-month study. And so the, the colors correspond to the individual months. And then the change in the symbols correspond to the increases in biochar application rate. And really what I want, you to, want to show you, this is some data from principal components analysis. And if you, if you just look at what the data looks like, I put a circle around the diamonds, all right? And the diamonds are the 10% biochar application rate. That's 100 tons per acre. It's kind of excessive. Nonetheless, they separate, the data separates at the 10% biochar application rate from the rest of the data. And without going into great detail, what this tells us is that when you apply biochars at a, a relatively low application rate, you typically see um, what the background soil signature would be. You have less bacteria and you have more fungi. But when you push the system, if you made a mistake in the field and you accidentally put on 10 tons or 100 tons per acre, when you push the system at these high rates, you cause a stress in the system. And we actually see more bacteria. In fact, it's gram-negative bacteria, so indicating stress, and less fungi. And I think the, the thing that's really cool about this project that a lot of other scientists don't do, and I, I tend to push systems when I do research, the cool thing is, is that when, you're, when we talk about biochar, we typically talk about biochar being very porous and a nice home for um, fungal hyphae. And that's not always the case. So it's just something that we as scientists really need to keep in mind when we're doing this kind of research. Another project that we worked on dealt with relative abundance of genes that are used in the nitrogen cycle. And so we looked at four, uh, four different genes um, pertaining to nitrification, nitrogen fixation, and two genes associated with denitrification. This was a project where we had switchgrass biochar added at zero up to 10% by weight. And in every instance, if you, if you see the bars, it looks like they're all going up. Okay, so what this is telling us is that when we add biochar or increasing amounts of biochar, we see more gene expression that is, that is associated with the nitrogen cycle. I think the thing that's really interesting here is that, to me, by large, you see the greatest increase in this gene that's associated with denitrification. And it's really interesting because if you take a look at what's out in the literature, when we had increasing amounts of biochar, what people, including myself, have typically thought would happen is you typically see a nitrate nitrogen decrease when you increase biochar application. I'm, I'm hoping that many of you have seen that in the literature. And many of us in the past have associated that with immobilization. And I think that we, we can't discount denitrification. And in fact, some work that's coming out of the ARS in St. Paul, Minnesota, is suggesting that we actually have chemi-denitrification, so abiotic denitrification occurring. 
And so it's something that I think as scientists we really need to keep in mind. We need to have an open mind when we work with these systems. So our future research, and I hope you agree with me in terms of my uh, crystal ball up here. This is what we're going to be doing. I, I have a feeling we're going to be doing this with the ARS, is that we're going to take biochar, and instead of using it as a straight product, we need to create some value-added products. For example, taking biochar and mixing it in with manure and co-composting, -co -co and it's been shown, it hasn't, I don't know if it's been published yet, but it's been shown by some of my colleagues in Colorado that when you co-compost, you actually capture some of the nitrogen that otherwise would volatilize, and so we have a value-added product at the end of the day. We also want to create designer biochars, and this may be taking um, two different feedstocks and mixing them together to create a product that's beneficial for a number of different things like we talked about this afternoon. And then, of course, we want to go to infield trials. I would say that if you're in production agriculture, large production agriculture, biochar probably doesn't have a, a place because of the cost of the char itself, but specialty or cash crops. Um, I got a phone call a couple weeks ago from somebody dealing with strawberries in Southern California looking at biochar for improving soil water relations. We need to be looking at those places, or mine land reclamation, places where perhaps there's some money. And then last but certainly not least, the, the ARS is actually working on a joint consortium with European, our European counterparts on basically everything that I've listed here today. And with that, uh, I'll put a shameless plug in for this new book coming out next year from Johannes Lehmann and, and Stephen Joseph, and we have a nice chapter in there that talks about those generalizations I mentioned up front. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Maybe one question? Yes, sir. Uh, just your comment about the increase in the need for nitrification. Is that for soils that were highly saturated or? That's a good question. So the question was the increase in the gene that was expressing uh, denitrification, did it occur in anaerobic soils? And, and no, it didn't. The soil was under about 70% field capacity. So, real interesting. Yeah, it wasn't saturated. <laughs>